everyone. Welcome to our first episode of the Hate Read Podcast. I'm Anna. And I'm Em. And, and we read a book <laughs> that we hated. <laughs> every, um, every fortnight. Every fortnight. <laughs> uh, one of us challenges the other to read a book that we think they'll hate. And we try to finish that book. And then we talk about it. <laughs> so this fortnight I challenged Anna to <laughs> I challenged Anna to read a book called Antigua Land of Fairies and I don't have the name written down so what is the name Anna Antigua the Land of Fairies Wizards and Heroes by Larry Ellis and Denise Brown Ellis but I think this was mostly a product of Denise Brown Ellis yeah I definitely got that vibe as well yeah so um First things first, Anna, did you finish the book? Oh my gosh, barely, but yes, I did. It was a struggle. This was an extreme <laughs> struggle. I wanted to die after the first page. Yeah, it was pretty terrible. <laughs> um, I got to the end, but I think the only reason I was able to get to the end was because I figured out a little past halfway point, I could just read the dialogue because she repeats everything in the dialogue that is represented in the rest of the text. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of repetition in this book. Um, I think probably if you cut it out, it would have been about five pages long. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason I picked this book is because this was our first episode and we wanted to do something really, really terrible. Um, generally on this uh, podcast, we're, we're not trying to target any particular author or say that their writing is bad. Um, we're just trying to pick books that we think the other person will hate. But in this case, the writing was really, really bad. Yes, and we really, really hated it. We just it. really hated it. Um, so since I kind of doubt anyone listening to this will have read this book, unless they also are a fan of hate reading things, do you want to <laughs> do a rundown of the plot just to explain what the hell happened in this book? We can attempt to because there was so much <laughs> that there happened so... that didn't need to happen yeah there was so little and yet so much yeah that's <laughs> it exactly so the the story immediately opens up with um about 50 exclamation points <laughs> describing how a, how a dragon burns down an entire village and this evil sorceress is cackling about it and no background about who any of these people are or why we should care, even about the village. Um, I think literally they burn this village down and the villagers go to complain to the king. And the king says, all right. And they like rebuild the entire village in a day or something. I don't know. But then we never hear from any of those people ever again. Yeah. It was also very confusing as to like, because they were like, let's go to the kingdom of King Arthur. Um, <laughs> but like they were from that kingdom. So that was all kind of a mess too yeah i w well i couldn't tell which province they were in because they shouldn't give she gave names true. to everything else every person every single thing that made an appearance so she has names for every single character in this book but then there are important things that they'll leave out they they won't name at all so there's four provinces in this world this land of Ant antigua 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 and they're just called the westernmost province, the easternmost province, yes. the southernmost province, and then I assume the northernmost province, I think they just called that the sorceress's lands, though, or something. I don't know. Yeah, I think it was just, well, because there was the north and there was the, like, more north. Yeah. <laughs> as it turned out by the end of this book. Mm-hmm. So the village gets burned down. They rebuild the village. And then we skip to, I don't know, maybe present day, um, or of present day for whenever this book was written, it's not really ever clarified, to this girl named Rebecca, who is maybe running away from an orphanage, and her brother's like, don't... I think that was... Yeah, I think that was it, like they were running away, and um, she, her, she's leaving her brother behind because of reasons, and he's like, <laughs> don't forget about me. Please come back. And she's like, all right, MVD, <laughs> you stay here. And then she just proceeds to go drown in a river. <laughs> Basically. Yeah. 
Yeah. That was a really great um, plan for making a life for herself, Mm -hmm. which was very, which was very confusing because um, she was running away to England. And at first, all that is explained of where she is from is that she is from Britain, Mm -hmm. which I don't know if everyone knows this, but like England is part of Britain. So that was kind of confusing. (laughs) I know. I know. Right. Um, but then later it's revealed that she's like way, way later. It's, uh, revealed that she's Welsh. So she is, which is really great if you, um, read all of her lines in a Welsh accent. Like that's. Oh, I didn't try that. (laughs) That might've made her. Reread this, reread this entire book, except imagine all of Rebecca's lines in a Welsh accent. Let me get right on that immediately after recording. Yes. (laughs) Um, so she drowns in the river. And she is then, like, some mermaids find her and breathe life back into her. And they say, oh, you must be this chosen girl who's who's come (laughs) from the lands beyond the waters of Antigua. And um, you only you can prevent the sorceress. And so she so she's like immediately on board with this. And was like, all right, take me to Antigua. I don't have a brother. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't forget me, Rebecca. Sure, Billy immediately forgets Billy. Immediately trusts in these mermaids after I've never seen a mermaid. I mean, why wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. Like mermaids, come on. So the mermaids, I don't know their names. I mean, you probably have their names somewhere, but they... Oh, there's... yes, I have their names. Let's hear their names because because Rebecca is the only normal name in this whole book. No, that's not true. There's Muffy also. Oh, right, right, right. Oh, and, and Bubba. And, and Bubba and Larry. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, the sorry, there's so many names. I wrote down every name in this book because there's so many. Uh, like Trandria. 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 I'm not sure how it's pronounced. Philiandra and Shrana. Yeah. And then there's also King King Ar- Aquarmand. Not, who is not- Sh- Shrandria's father and King Harnaqua. Yeah. Which is, I think, the most normal name of the bunch. <laughs> I like how they all kind of sound like something else. Like, the whatever the first king, he kind of sounds like King Aquaman, but no, not really. Or like King Aquaman. Uh, it, exactly. <laughs> and King Arthur an in is kind of like King Arthur, right. but not. Right, but with like eight extra R's. And he has like seven knights of an oval table. <laughs> did you catch that? <laughs> yes. And also, did you did you catch the table that talks? Not the table that talks, but I did capture another another um object that shouldn't be able to do those things talking for no reason whatsoever. It's not explained <laughs> at all. There's there's a table that has a name and it talks, but it never actually like they state they're like, oh, the talking table is Adora, but she never actually says anything. I don't know how I missed that. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, I was like, am I high right now? What's happening? <laughs> what am I reading? <laughs> so these three mermaids of complicated name take Rebecca to <laughs> the good king because there's two kings of the water and I King Aquaman right. is the good king, and King Herman Aqua, or whatever his name is, is the bad guy. And he's their uncle and blah, blah, blah. So they take her to the king and the good king, and he monologues on for a bit. Aha, how he's so grateful to meet Rebecca because she's the chosen daughter. And then sends her away with an honor guard to go to take her from the bottom of the ocean to the land. But as they do so, a... <laughs> A nosy octopus named Charlie is spying. <laughs> Who is my favorite. And I wish that that wasn't an exact quote from the book, but it is. A nosy <laughs> octopus named Charlie, page 15 of Antigua, Land of Fairies, Kings, and Heroes, scuttles back to the bad merman king. And <laughs> I forgot, one of my favorite quotes in this book, sorry to backtrack a little, is and I, I captured this quote because I love it so much. Your uncle has become a very dangerous merman. <laughs> <laughs> I like the part where where Charlie says he has sent warrior merman sharks, octopuses, and even a giant whale. They're a tough looking bunch of fish. Yes. It's like 
Charlie, only one of those things is a type of fish. What are you talking about? <laughs> this is a fantasy You're world. You're an octopus. <laughs> You're an octopus. You should know what a fish is. <laughs> this is a fantasy world. Anything can be a fish now. <laughs> Anything's a fish. Everything's a fish. It's fine. <laughs> so then they have like a very anticlimactic battle, which I didn't get the exact quote, but I know okay, I... It is not anticlimactic because... The octopuses and squids began to sword fight. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. It's it's essentially like this group begins to sword fight. That group begins to sword fight. The battle, now the and, battle has begun. And the sharks from both sides began to attack each other with their noses made of sharp swords. <laughs> That's not what a shark is. <laughs> I can't picture what part like of the Like, they're literally shark's talking about sword. swordfish. <laughs> they're talking about a swordfish, but they call them sharks. <laughs> they don't know what a shark is. They do. <laughs> I think someone needed a zoology lesson before even attempting to write yes. this book. Because there's another yes. instance where very later on in the book. Well, I'm going to get to it in a second because we get to skip a bunch of the book because nothing happens. Right, right. So basically, basically for the next hundred pages, I think, so this fighting stuff happened on page like 16 or 17, maybe. Yep. Rebecca completely disappears until around page 160. The rest is like these episodic filler scenes, where it's as if the author, she finished writing one night and then woke up the next morning and was like, I feel like writing about this now. And so we just get all these (laughs) weird scenes of like back to back characters that have nothing to do with each other, characters we never see again, interacting with each other, getting named and doing something like (laughs) completely stupid and innocuous. I I just... (sighs) <laughs> so much anger. It it essentially goes through each of the three lands that aren't ruled by an evil sorceress and is like, this is the land. This is what lives there. This is the king and queen and princess who's in charge of it. Here's a funny story about whatever magical creature lives here. Here's a funny story about the wizard. Here's a funny story about the princess doing some dumb shit. And now we're done. Like, that's essentially 140 pages of this book. Yes, and I and it doesn't make it clear. Are these things happening co- alongside Rebecca's journey through the ocean or through the river? Like, is Rebecca underwater for months? Or are these things I didn't all, even consider like, that. Flashbacks? Because <laughs> there was a lot. I assumed they were, like, all kind of happening at the same time. Like the wizard battle thing like i figured that was kind of happening in the one kingdom while the other kingdom was having the centaurs and the holograms and whatever yeah holograms like is this i thought this was a fantasy book and then all of a sudden you bring holograms in yeah this this goes into the pile of things that the ellises do not know (laughs) what a hologram is like there's so many of them but yeah like so i think I think they're all happening concurrently, but yeah, it's still like a lot of stuff to be happening while Rebecca's underwater with the mermaids, yes. but... And and two, and some of the scenes, so okay, so we have, some of it you think is going to be really important. We have the centaurs. We meet about right. like, I don't know, 20 different centaurs, and they have yes, this approximately. really funny banter about, between them, like, <laughs> <laughs> another one of my favorite, favorite quotes. I don't have to be a gentleman. I'm a horse. <laughs> that is excellent. Very, very good bants from the centaurs. Absolutely. Who are also somewhat, I mean, I thought at first this was exclusive to the centaurs, but I think it's kind of all of the creatures in this land are all kind of like Smurfs where they just like slide their name into like everything. They're like, oh, the <laughs> centaur women were talking to the centaur men at the centaur barn and i'm like you don't have to qualify we know your centaurs we like got it's fine that. <laughs> we're and good like, we're good also does a centaur refer to himself as a horse that seems a little bit <laughs> unusual <laughs> i mean we get to the part later where the uh the head centaur of the unicorns is horse racist oh where she won't oh my allow. gosh she won't mix the two- oh my gosh <laughs> 
<laughs> she won't allow horses essay. into the into the unicorn village. That is a whole essay. What? <laughs> right, right. I was like, um, excuse you. So there's some weird there's some weird racial tensions I think between centaurs, unicorns, and normal horses. I, yeah, <laughs> gets weird. <laughs> um, so. Okay, so there's all that garbage in between. We get to meet, basically she lists character names and gives each character one trait about them. But everybody, it sounds yes. like everybody else. There's no personalities. None of these characters are like the least bit likable, except for one or two of them. And, and even and, that's kind of a stretch. Even that's kind of a stretch. And I think the only reason we like them is because they shit all over the other characters. <laughs> so, I like, also, I enjoy the fact that she like, very clearly was running out of traits to give some of these characters because like by the time she gets to the third kingdom like the knight's traits are the youngest and most charming is the first one the Mm -hmm. second one is funny and the third one's traits is that he's old (laughs) she's like oh this gnome is the grouchiest this gnome is intellectual this gnome is athletic this gnome does magic tricks (laughs) Like, that's a character trait, I guess? Sure, sure. We'll go with that. Sure, sure. (laughs) So we go through all this garbage where the sorceress seems to interact with these people's lives in different ways throughout the book. And then, finally, around page 160, Rebecca exits the river. She, the the mermaids (laughs) drop her off, put her on land, be like, the king is that way and immediately ghost her. They just disappear for forever. <laughs> That's not true. They come back at the very end to wave at her from a rock. Oh, right, right. <laughs> They're like, great. Glad you, glad you survived. Like, you did good all job. The you didn't die. <laughs> Our part in this is over. So the first thing Rebecca does upon exiting the river is she comes across a tree and tries to take oranges from it because she's hungry because it's probably been like a thousand years since she's eaten and right yeah <laughs> the, it turns out the tree talks and is super like offended that she would try to take his oranges without asking her but then rebecca does i mean that's pretty rude like come on pretty rude pretty rude but then rebecca and rebecca's one trait is apparently she's totally braggadocious because she immediately says to the tree, I'm the chosen girl. Hello. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Excuse you. Don't you know who I am? Rebecca is like waltzing up to this tree with the may I see your manager haircut. Like, <laughs> just so Don't offended. you know who I am? <laughs> Excuse you. Can I talk to someone else? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I deserve these oranges. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm gonna I'm gonna save everyone's lives here probably. So she talks, she meets talking tree, the talking tree's like, Oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't realize here have as many oranges as you want. And she just thinks and she I guess eats one and keeps going. And then meets <laughs> a talking gorilla. <laughs> yes. Which okay. There there there's talking animals in this book. We've established that. But this gorilla is like so again, she blurts out, this is this is who I am, this is my purpose, but don't tell that sorceress that can spy on everyone every time all the time, everywhere. <laughs> I should keep talking about this really loudly though. Yeah, and really obviously. And not knowing who these people are that I'm introducing myself to. But apparently it's okay because this gorilla is a total fanboy for the girl from beyond the lands of the waters of whatever. And right. he says, I'll take you to this king's meeting that they're having, some big fair or market or whatever. They didn't really explain what the what the carnival was all about. But yeah, we'll take you to this. <laughs> they're just having Yeah, one. we'll take you to this meeting of the kings. But first, you got to come home with me and meet my wife and kid. <laughs> The kid who, so again, baby gorilla, incidentally, who is explicitly uh, stated to be fed uh, cow's milk. They they (laughs) say that they get a bottle of cow's milk. In the narration, it's like the mom gorilla gets a bottle of cow's milk to give to the baby. And I'm like, why did you think that that would be less disturbing than the gorilla breastfeeding? Like, (laughs) in what world? (laughs) 
that less disturbing that these gorillas are going out and milking cows in order to feed their children? Like what? We don't we don't even feed baby humans cow's milk. Like I don't know what you're talking about. Like this is insanity. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, this poor woman gorilla, she must do all the work around the house because she immediately starts ragging on her husband about how he dare bring anyone home to their messy gorilla house without (laughs) asking her. And he goes, no, wait, honey, listen, let me tell you who it is. It's someone really important. And she goes, well, wait, why would you bring someone really important home without talking to me first? (laughs) But it's okay because she's also a fangirl. But she's smart about it. She's like, you got to shut up about this shit. And we got to get it to the kings as soon as possible. Why did you bring her here to observe our messy house and weird eating habits? Exactly. <laughs> the only character with any sense is this female gorilla. So they go on. They're going to the king's meeting. And on the way, they're like accosted by a fox. Yes. I'm so glad you brought this, this up. This to me, I was so angry. They get into a fight with this fox because even though he's not equal, he don't give no shits about saving the world or, or you know, preserving right, his own right. life. He's just a bad dude. And so he sees two gorillas. Just a rad, bad fox. <laughs> and he sees two gorillas and he's like, I can take them. I, I could do it. He fights them and he wins. <laughs> he fucking wins. The gorillas are like injured and like Yes. No, I think I think that he the gorillas do win. But oh, okay. at great cost to themselves. At yeah. great personal injury. Which like gorillas can destroy human beings. I think a right. little fox like do they not do they not look at the two animals and be like, hmm, one of these things is a lot <laughs> smaller and tinier than these. Anna. <laughs> Anna, they don't know what a fox is. They don't know what foxes or a gorilla. Like, I mean, again, this is uh, about 180 pages into the book, probably at this point, right? And yeah. like this fox shit is happening. And you've been through so much else reading this book at this point. You're just like kind of numb to it. But yeah. then this fox starts fighting a gorilla and you're like, it. it's very... It jolts you awake again and lets you fully realize how completely batshit this book is. It reawakens your hatred. (laughs) You're like, yeah, sure, centaurs. Yeah, sure, gorillas drinking milk. What the fuck is happening with this fox? (laughs) There's no rhyme or reason to any of this, but all of them now go, they, they arrive at the king's province. I think it's King Arthur's province. Yes. And they present Rebecca to the king. And the king is, like, immediately on board with all of this. Like, ah, oh, yes, you are the chosen girl. Like, no yeah. one questions her. No one's like, prove nope. it. No one's like, what prophecy? Everyone in this entire world. And the, the prophecy is bizarrely straightforward. Yeah. It's not like, from the depths shall arise a warrior. Like, it's like... There's going to be a chick who comes from the other sides of the waters of Antigua and she's going to defeat the sorceress. Like, that's Mm -hmm. essentially the prophecy. And also, this whole time, (laughs) Rebecca has been told that she's going to defeat the sorceress, but she doesn't think to question how until this moment. No. She she asked the king, (laughs) but I'm not a warrior. I don't know how to do nothing. How am I going to be the the queen? And then he goes, well, actually... Y'all, there was another prophecy. Pew, 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 pew. Right. Right. <laughs> right. There was the secret prophecy. Yeah. So thank goodness we really got to know those other three princesses throughout the rest of the book because it, the three of them and Rebecca all have to team up to shoot these very special arrows and all four of them will hit their mark and kill the dragon. And the four, I think the arrow is like the head of the, of the, the head centaur of the unicorns has these four arrows. And so they have to go to her to get that. And Rebecca's like, well, I don't know how to shoot a bow and arrow. And they're like, it's fine. We'll train you in a five minute montage and you'll be perfect. Which 
somehow and she is. Also, two of the three other princesses also don't really know how to shoot air. They all have special weapons. The one has a sword. Oh my god. The one has a special stick. No, yeah. Literally which... the only way that weapon is described in this book is as a special stick. Does she mean bow staff? We don't know. We we can only assume. But then Princess I think Alexandra knows how to shoot arrows, so she teaches the other ones how to shoot arrows in five minutes Mm -hmm. i guess i don't know yeah it's literally like the beginning of the training sequence rebecca didn't know how to shoot by the end by the middle she was making some shots and at the end all of the princesses could shoot at the same target and hit it in the exact same spot like mm. although to be fair the target was also a tree so that's true (laughs) i'm not sure if they know this but dragons move (laughs) They also fly and breathe fire, which can destroy arrows. I'm pretty sure. Okay, so then this whole time, by the way, there were also these, like, three boy wizards. And they were the apprentice to one of the master wizards, like, (laughs) Glanfrude, or I don't know which one it was. Like, (laughs) do you have the name? Um, I do. I think it might be Vlander... Vlanderoofed? And I... I think the authors also might be somewhat confused between, like, a wizard and a jester because, like, literally when they're introduced, they're like, he has a funny beard and all the children (laughs) laugh at him. Yeah, they, like, go to the village and they just, like, pull rabbits out of hats, literally pulling rabbits out of their hats for the joy of the children. And this is their job as master wizard apprentices or something. Yeah, not dealing with the evil sorceress who's like apparently causing havoc amongst everybody but just like eliciting laughter from small children yeah that's it that's (laughs) like that's that's their job or creating potions that's good that's good some strange goblin comes up to your house and drinks and there are no consequences for that yeah that was weird too or going through uh the forest to try to find exotic ingredients like donkey's dung (laughs) that is (laughs) Literally a thing that happens in this book is the wizard is described as looking for exotic ingredients and then the ingredient is donkey shit. <laughs> Which like okay. Maybe it was just some primo donkey shit like the specialist like pooped right at midnight under this tree granted magical powers to the steaming pile of crap. Sure, we'll go with that. <laughs> So, so there's these three boy wizards, Brandon, William, and Jonathan. There's, yeah, there's some normal names for you. Brandon, William, and Jonathan. William is like the all-star, like, um, he's on the varsity team. He's, he's the lead boy wizard at 16. He's just so good at everything he does. Brandon is like the poor kid who tries so hard, but just is not good at anything. And Jonathan is a dick. (laughs) as i think (laughs) jonathan jonathan has some issues i think that's like his main his main personality flaw is that he just he just is got a bad dude man he (laughs) (laughs) it's like he's the kid that the wizard vanderloop goes to like the parent teacher conference and they're like oh yeah i remember having william he was so great Jonathan's having some troubles making friends in class, though. Like, (laughs) Jonathan's hitting his teachers again. (laughs) Because this kid, he has a chip on his shoulder for no reason other than that William is a little bit better and Jonathan wants attention. But Jonathan never does anything to deserve this attention. He just thinks he's deserved it um yeah and so he has this grand idea one day he's gonna show them all he's gonna challenge william to a wizard showdown and this is while they're preparing to have this great battle against this sorceress so like there's other shit to be worried about jonathan the day before they go to fight yeah yeah and jonathan's like no this needs to be settled now yeah jonathan jonathan's not waiting around to prove he's the greatest boy wizard in town so (laughs) <laughs> they they go to this like alternate universe or something where basically earlier in the novel the great wizard Vanderluft took the whole kingdom of um the whatever province to this alternate universe by I think like they spin around real fast or something was the was the vibe that I was getting <laughs> everyone yeah. just spins around real fast 
and they end yeah. up in this alternate universe where the Grand Master Wizards live. And this brings my favorite character name into play here. My favorite best best character. So they have these Grand Master Wizards who are basically in charge of this goofy alternate universe where anything can happen because all they do here in this world is shoot off tricks and you can only get here once you're a retired Master Wizard, right? <laughs> the best character name. Grand Master Wizard Groshua. <laughs> Not Joshua. <laughs> Groshua. <laughs> See, I liked Grashua, but I was so sure I knew what your favorite character name was. Oh, who'd you think? Because towards the end of the book, towards the end of the book, there is a character who is named Natrasha. <laughs> Not I... Natasha. <laughs> Natrasha. <laughs> like, she's garbage. So, so they go to have this showdown, which is basically like the third, the third task in the Triwizard Tournament. They've got to basically yeah. go and retrieve these objects and be the first one to make it back in time. And, of course, William wins, but Jonathan is sabotaging him the whole way. And Brandon even pulls through and, like, does some stuff to make him relevant. But, really, William's the star here. We all know it. <laughs> A-plus, William. Good job. So, Jonathan gets all sad, sack that he didn't win this tournament that he planned. Even though, constantly, this, this is the other thing, the Grandmasters... And Master Wizards were all like, this isn't a competition, but we will declare a winner. <laughs> we have to stress, right. this is not right. a competition. It's just practice and training for the fight this with the not... sorceress. Not a competition. William won, though. <laughs> but one of you one of you will clearly be decided as far superior to the others, and the rest of you are trash. Yeah. So, you so know, don't even... <laughs> make it that what you will. <laughs> don't even bother fighting the sorceress. Which Jonathan doesn't. He doesn't bother fighting the sorceress. Instead, he decides, and we could have all we all saw this coming about two hundred pages ago. But he's gonna go off and join the sorceress. Right. He's gonna pull a, a Edmund. Yeah, yeah, basically. But instead of like at least having some of the guts that Edmund does and following along with with the queen, he immediately gets there and goes, "Oh no, I have made a terrible mistake." <laughs> he immediately backpedals. He's like, "Oh shit, this was not good." And. And I think I know the reason why he backpedals is because the sorceress lives in a stink palace. Let me explain. <laughs> Emily, Emily has just spit out her drink, by the way. She's like, the sorceress lives in a stink palace. She has about like 70 animals, basically. Um, of all different types. And we know she's not cleaning up after that because she's an evil sorceress with too much time on her hands. <laughs> but she also employs these trolls to, to, to build her weapons for her goblin army. Why the trolls can't fight, I don't know. But the trolls have only ever been described as being stinking, disgusting creatures who <laughs> dribble snot all of the time. <laughs> They're like, the trolls never take baths. Yes, ne yes. They're very, they're very insistent. She goes to very great pains to show how s stinky this, these trolls are, how disgusting and wretched they are. And they live in this woman's palace with her menagerie of animals. We, when we first are introduced to the sorceress officially, I don't know how many pages in the book, but way after we've interacted with her as readers, she is described as owning, I don't know how many animals, but each one is her secret best friend. Like, she's got black panthers. She's got alligators. Okay, I think the alligators are just guarding oh. the moat. And then she's got 80 black panthers, but two that are her special friends. Mm -hmm. And then, like, an undescribed number of snakes, but like one that she's really yeah, tight just with. like creepy crawly creatures. And then the and then the bl <laughs> the black cat that she keeps around but actually yes. hates <laughs> keeps her in check. <laughs> yes, the black cat whose explicit purpose stated in the text is that it is sarcastic and like keeps her like from getting too full of herself. Like that is which is like really. Very self-aware for an evil villain. Yes, <laughs> she's like, I don't, I don't want to get a big head. Better keep this cat around. Better, yeah. <laughs> basically, and also 
basically this the sorceress has been characterized as like Rita from the Power Rangers. Like she just spies on people. Yes, that was the vibe I got. She just spies on people from her like tower and cackles maniacally. All she does is send like villain after villain to die against these princesses and knights and to like mildly inconvenient yes this is her this is her grandmaster plan she hates everyone so much she just wants to like make their days a little bit awful she's not a very effective villain i was never scared of her i have nightmares about her still (laughs) sorceress guendevere and her stink palace right right i don't think we've mentioned that her name is guendevere yeah guendevere Uh, at least, at least Guinevere wasn't married to King Arthur, I guess. That would have been too much. Yeah, that was Eleanor Dora, was King Arthur's (laughs) wife. So Jonathan runs to the sorceress, immediately regrets it, and then, like, we basically forget about him. No, no consequences. Even though he, he vocalizes this desire to leave to the sorceress, she's like, no. And he's like, well, all right, I'll sit around, I guess, and try to sneak out later. Like, she never tries to imprison him. She never tries to punish him or anything for coming and immediately regretting it. And she's like, I'm going to use you later to, like, manipulate every- that nothing No one likes that. Jonathan. Like, she's like, oh, I'm going to use you. Right, that's true. He would be a terrible person to use as a pawn slash hostage, like, because everybody hates him. But, like, also... She doesn't even try to do that. Like, she's like, oh, great. Now I have a hostage and I can use him to manipulate them. And, like, doesn't at all. Like, she talks about that for a yeah. good page. And then nothing comes out These of that. These characters like most, monologue most the entire book. book. Like, they will talk for an entire Constantly. page or two of text. And there were no paragraph breaks that Just, made like, sense. constant exposition. It was very frustrating. Um, yes. So everyone fights the next day. And basically every character that was ever mentioned has at least like a three or four word cameo. Um, and the the girls all shoot their arrows. They they kill the dragon. It's all it all happens in like two lines of dialogue. The the girls aim their arrows and the dragon fell down and died. Great. Guinevere. Yeah. She's killed. It, it also in the same amount of text. Like and they and they fought her they shoved her into a tree with magic and then she died. Um, Rebecca's role in this entire novel and the events of the novel was very minimal it was shoot 25 percent of a dragon yeah like they could have just found another 16 year old girl probably um but she did snag her some sweet william wizard booty do you want to talk about uh shipping right now because i have a few thoughts um Shipping in so much as the fact that, like, the only couple I was really interested in was myself and the end of this book. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so in this book, there are two main uh, romances going on, and it's uh, William and Rebecca. And by romances, I mean, like, William throws a lot of exposition at Rebecca, and this apparently makes Rebecca into William, and then they, like, kiss on the cheek before Rebecca pieces yeah, out. Yeah, and says, I'll never see you um, again. Goodbye. <laughs> Yeah, and then uh, Timothy and Alexandria. Um, (laughs) I fucking hated Timothy so much. Quick aside, Timothy is Alexandra's boyfriend, sort of, who's, like, introduced with absolutely no context. They're just like, oh, and Timothy was there, too. (laughs) And then, like, like, years later, you find out that Timothy is her special friend or whatever. Yeah, like, we don't know. Is he a knight? Is he a squire? Is he just, like, a kitchen boy? What is he? He's just Timothy. He's just Timothy. They it's train together, Timothy. and he loves her, and she's like, "Everyone's accepting." She's like, "I'm too young to be she, in a romance." She fiance zones him. <laughs> she fiance zones him, which is like the weirdest thing. She's like, "Well, we'll probably end up together sometime, but we're not going to date right now." And I'm like, "What are you even?" She and her dad is like, "Well, you're going to be married eventually." Like everyone is just like so sure they're going to be married, and she's even she's even cool with it. But she's like, "But." absolutely we are not going to be a couple I'm too right young now. to be and in I'm a like, relationship okay. but not too young to know I'm going to marry you like okay you should try that right, out right right it was very confusing before you commit yeah those couples were terrible and I hated them but um also 100% Rebecca wanted to hook up with that mermaid 100% cuz like she was so every beautiful. time Rebecca she was so beautiful. I was like, Rebecca, Rebecca, honey. <laughs> Rebecca's just like, she's so pretty. And like, 
they get out of the water and are sitting on a rock and it's like the mermaid scooted closer to Rebecca. And I'm like, what is happening? (laughs) What is actually happening? Is this what? Like, so I was very sure that Rebecca was in love with this mermaid. And I think that the reason she fell for William was because William, like the mermaid, just constantly spouts exposition. Yeah. So she was like, you remind me of my love, that mermaid. <laughs> Who just ditched me on the shores of the waters of Antiza. Who just ditched so me. So they, they all celebrate because they think that they've won, they've defeated everyone. And then you're sitting there like, but there's so much more book left. What? Maybe this is just a preview for there's the like second novel in the series. Maybe, maybe we just get like a really long epilogue about what happens in the kingdom after. no. No, what happens is we're transported to another area of Antigua where there is a girl who can ride a dragon. After we've been told in this book that no humans ride dragons and there's only the only dragon is Voraltar. They're too poor to go to the celebration that the whole kingdom is having. So they decide to have their own mini celebration in their poor little village. And... This girl is like, hey, by the way, I'm really important character because I'm BFFs with the head centaur of the unicorns. So I'm going to go there and talk to her about all the events that have been happening. And she goes there and the head centaur says, I'm going to very obviously set up the sequel for these books with you as the main lead by telling you there are more prophecies and we have to be aware of them. I won't tell you the prophecies, though, because I have to go to this party. Goodbye. She does tell her the prophecy that her entire village is going to be oh, destroyed. Right, right. She's like, she's like, everyone you love will die. Okay, bye. bye. I'm going to go celebrate now. <laughs> the girl's like, no way. And she flies back to her village on her dragon where she comes across the sorceress Gwendevere's. Is it her niece? Her niece is the one who rides the dragon because Gwendevere's sister is like too distraught to do anything. And so she's like, daughter. Uh, it's Arlissanda is oh, the God. sister and then Princess Bianca. Like, number one, how do titles work in this world? Because what is she princess of? Um, also, there's like like the... Evil. Right. Like the girl who's introduced in this like mini segment, the Dragon Rider, she's called Lady Alamage, but then both of her sisters are princesses. So again, how do princesses work? Also... That's too many princesses. There are too many princesses in this book. Not enough land. <laughs> right, right. Everyone's just princess, okay? Because I think Rebecca gets turned into a princess. They call her Don't Princess they like, Rebecca. They're like, you are now a princess. Yeah, yeah, which is bullshit. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so Princess Bianca also has a dragon. She rides the dragon to go burn down some villages because her mom's like, I'm so sad about my estranged sister's death. Mm-hmm. Please go, please go, like, wreak havoc on everybody else for me. So Bianca's like, sure, mom. I just want you to be happy again, mom. Mom, I'm so sorry you're depressed. Like, Bianca's a good daughter, you guys. Yeah, Bianca did no wrong. (laughs) (laughs) They get into, like, this dog fight in the sky, a dragon v. dragon, and the good dragon dies. Bianca and her dragon live to see another day. They fly away. So the girl who's left behind wakes up, discovers everyone is dead, um, and her dragon is dead, vows to never ride another dragon again, vows to, like, she, she's like, I need to inform everyone that the, actually, I'm not going to inform everybody. Screw those guys. They're off celebrating while I'm suffering. She comes up with this plan after, okay, back up a little bit. This boy comes out of nowhere. <laughs> The best character. Athral the Eagle Man. He was born this way, as he proclaims loudly. He was born this way, but he didn't sprout wings until age 11. Yeah. Why did you even say you were born this way then? What are you talking about? (laughs) So she passes out from exhaustion, and he's like, Man, I really should take her to the king, but if I do that, she might never talk to me again. He's like, 
this girl is the closest thing I have to family now. What are you talking about? What does that mean? Yes, what does that mean? You just met her. <laughs> so he, instead of doing the right thing and going to inform the kings, he decides to, to aid and abet this girl and take her to a secret forest full of rogue knights, which are basically knights that didn't agree with how the kingdoms were being run. And it's like Robin Hood because they all live in the woods. And the book, that's the end of that storyline. <laughs> right, right. We're done with that. Now back to the party. Yeah. So back to the happy party where the book, where, where, where we all wanted to be. Um, everyone's saying goodbye to Rebecca. She and William have a kind of tearful parting where they hug each other and say, I'll always remember you. And they kiss on the cheek. And she waves at literally every character that ever was mentioned in this book. Which is a lot of characters. How many characters was it, Emily? Um, okay, so it's kind of hard to tell because there's a couple that are kind of, um, might be the same character, but probably aren't. The lowest number of named characters that I could come up with was 230, which to put that in perspective, <laughs> this book is a little over 300 pages long. So there is a new character, uh, every one and a third page, essentially, which uh, <laughs> in the entire Game of Thrones series, there are 2,103 characters, which is one character every four pages. So like, think of how many characters are in Game of Thrones and like have the, int- the characters be introduced almost four times as fast. And that's yeah. this book. And also with the added perk of that none of them died in, in Antigua yes. because the head centaur of the unicorns has this magical potion at the end of the battle oh, that God, revives... Oh, God, I forgot about that. <laughs> it revives all of the people on the good side, basically, because it only works on people who are pure of heart. So then Rebecca somehow... I, does she go back in the water? Like, I don't know how she gets home. Yeah, I think it. it she goes back in the water, but then uh, it cuts to her waking up in a bed in the orphanage. Because <laughs> guess what? It might have all been a dream. It was all a dream. And she learned not to run away from her problems, which I don't know how she, like, that's not a message I took away from this book, but apparently she did. So yeah, good for run, her. running away from her problems brought her a, brought her a title. She became a princess when she, she ran princess. away from her problems. She got she a sort of boyfriend. Glory. Yeah. She got a boyfriend and a sort of girlfriend if we're to, yeah. If the, yeah. So, I mean, she had a lot of fun. But then at the very last second, one of the creatures shows up and only Rebecca sees her and like she winks at Rebecca and it's like, oh, it was all real. I'm like, why? Why? Why do you? Why? (laughs) I don't know which ending is worse. So that is that is the plot. So we don't have too much time to talk about other stuff, honestly, because that plot took so long to get through. Um is there uh, anything in particular you would like to talk about real quick? Mini wands. What are they? <laughs> um, no one knows. This is a concept no one is familiar with. This is I Googled it. There is no such thing as mini oh, wands yeah, in any it fantasy. Too. So it's a it's a, a fantasy race she created with the with the fantastical name of Mini Wad. They are tiny people about four <laughs> feet tall. So like Just tiny you know, wads. Halflings Halflings weren't good enough for, for no. her. She had to invent mini wads. Which also, like, there's so many fantasy races in this book, and basically they're all the same thing. They're all just, like, slightly mischievous tiny people. Like, there's mm-hmm. mini wads, there's gnomes, there's pixies, there's fairies, there's fairies, which are <laughs> not explained at all, but no. that's fine. Every week we wanted to uh, decide which character you most or each each of us most identifies with so who was the character that you most identified with in the this book the character i most identified with in this book is the the dragon rider girl at the end who was like screw all these people i don't care about any of you i'm going to go live my own <laughs> life because you all suck <laughs> that was my girl for me it was jonathan <laughs> which you kind of yes, get jonathan <laughs> um because first of all he is clearly suffering from middle child syndrome, which is like my <laughs> life. 
Um, <laughs> he's just like, well, I'm not as good as my older brother, but I'm not as cute as my younger brother. Like, this is <laughs> my entire life. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Um, Wizard Apprentice M. <laughs> also... His ability to commit to something and then immediately be like, shit, this was a bad idea. <laughs> I immediately regret also this me. decision. But the reason I most identify with Jonathan is one of his earliest, the earliest quotes about him. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> and it says, Princess Alexandria whispered to Timothy, who again, hasn't been introduced at this point. Um, I have never seen anything this beautiful before. Timothy whispered back, I have. I see such beauty every time I look at you. (laughs) Princess Alexandra blushed. The wizard apprentice Jonathan shook his head. He found their conversation to be stupid. (laughs) Yes. I I captured that quote. Same. And I just wrote me. (laughs) Yes. Uh, So relatable. Jonathan is so relatable. Yeah. He's, he's good. As is the black cat. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't talk much about the black cat, but like essentially, like we said, the black cat shows up to deliver snark and, it does a good job of it, I would say. Yeah. Like, my favorite is when, when the cat, when the wizard apprentice Jonathan shows up to the castle for the first time. Um, I think he makes, I can't remember um, who he was calling stupid and ugly, but the cat responds, who is he calling stupid and ugly? Has he looked in a mirror and seen his own face lately? Hey! <laughs> <laughs> Burned him. <laughs> Got him. Um, yeah, the cat's great. Um, this goes into a segment that... Um, I wanted, we wanted to do, which is, uh, trying to find the positive side of this book. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, so did you, did you have a, a, uh, silver lining to this book? Gosh, this is a really hard one for this book because it was all just a bunch of crap. Um, I think, it was. <laughs> I think the silver lining for me was the unintentional hilarity of some of these, some of these lines in this book. <laughs> <laughs> like we mentioned earlier a talking table that never really talked there was also a point where the um one of the princesses is spying on her wizard friend and mm. they throw in the line the cottage smiled as the girl hit on the side of it <laughs> what <laughs> Did it? Yeah. <laughs> then there's another another line a little bit further in the book. These goblins were half human and half bat. Wait, then they're right. not goblins what? at all. Like there's just this book. Was That's so not what a goblin funny. is. It was just hilarious. Um, my silver lining is this book taught me so much because the Ellises clearly do not have. There, there are just so many things that the Ellis's clearly do not understand what they are. And it made me doubt if I knew what they were. So I was Googling <laughs> constantly. I was like, are foxes, do foxes get that big? Surely not. So like now I know that the biggest a red fox, which is the biggest of fox, like the biggest fox there is, only can get to 14 inches tall. So it, it definitely could not beat a gorilla in a fight. But constantly I'm like, like with the whole Britain thing, I was like looking up the geography of Wales to see if there was a river that this would even make sense for. So this book encouraged me to to learn more. <laughs> because I think I think you mentioned in text that you think they're aliens. Yes. I believe, I fully believe that the Ellises are aliens. And um they here is a list of things that the Ellises do not know what they are. Komodo dragons, <laughs> wands. Which they apparently think oh my you God, fly I forgot around about on, that the there's some magic sort of wand. vehicle. <laughs> People are constantly hopping on their magic wands and flying around, which like, okay, whatever. Holograms, unicorns, because in their world, unicorns fly. have wings <laughs> and fly around, which again, not what a unicorn is. Britain, we've already talked about. The concept of exoticism, and then foxes and gorillas. And I'm sure I, I missed some, but um, <laughs> yeah, they call things exotic all the time. Nothing is exotic. They're like, there were so many exotic plants and trees. And the plants that are described are like orange trees, grass, <laughs> blueberries. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> what are you actually? No, those things are not. I mean, like, the whole exotic thing is, like, kind of problematic anyway. But, like, that those things aren't exotic. So I'm pretty sure the Ellises are actual aliens and are just, like, not really sure what 
any of this stuff is. And they're like, this is a whole new exotic world. What's an orange? I don't know. What's a Komodo dragon? Don't know. Going to put it in this book. What's a shark? Probably they have swords attached to their face. Probably. (laughs) That seems likely. Anything's possible in this fantasy world I've created. There are no rules. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Oh, man. This was A plus literature. I wrote a list of all of the magic spells that were mentioned in this book. Oh, God. Alakazabra. Alakazaba. Kazetchum. Stretchum. And I believe that was the spell used to make the magic wand larger so multiple people could fly on it. Yes. Transdorm. Yes. Transform. <laughs> yes, slither. Was. And then to prove that their inconsistency, both Kazala Kaboom and Kazaba Kaboom Electrum do the same thing, which is to shoot electricity, <laughs> which electricity come on shoot electricity (laughs) at william (laughs) specifically at william specifically at william yeah (laughs) it's it's a huge mess just i mean that's really how you could describe this book in general uh it is a huge huge mess yeah and and to be fair from what i from what i've researched of this book that hasn't been deleted from the internet because apparently there was a lot of drama between the author and reviewers of this book but this was one of the books that was um that came along in that first wave of self-publishing once amazon kindle opened that up to the layperson and so maybe just someone was a little overzealous and (laughs) decided to put this out there before it was entirely ready but it's still out there for you to purchase. Yeah, like I feel like there's just there were many opportunities for this book to be better. Like honestly at some points when I was reading it, I was like this is not necessarily a bad plot. This is like I mean, it's nonsensical and it's mixed up, but it's like it's a pretty generic like standard fantasy plot. Yeah. Like it's not it's not bad in and of itself. It's just so poorly handled that it became this huge mess. Yeah, like you said, it it definitely felt like they wrote it down, they rushed through it, and they were just like, this is good, this is done, let's put it out there. Let's just be done with it. Wipe our hands clean. this is the result. Right, Yeah. right. Um, So yeah, it was, it was not good. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad to put this behind me. (laughs) Yeah, so since I challenged you to read this book, that means it is, your turn to pick. Do you have a book ready? So this book is called They'd Rather Be Right by Mark Clifton. It okay. is the winner of a Hugo Award. Okay. Um, the second Hugo Award to ever given out. And it is often heralded as the worst book to ever win a Hugo ever. It was written <laughs> in 1954. All right. So <laughs> it should make for interesting reading. Do you have a plot synopsis that you would, uh, like a Goodreads plot synopsis that you would like to... Uh read real quick yeah it's a little bit long but i will i'll I'll try and read it we can edit out whatever (laughs) okay bossy was right always invariably she was limited only in that she had to have facts not assumptions with which to work given those facts her conclusions and predictions were inevitably correct and that made bossy a ticking bomb bossy had been designed as a servo mechanism for guiding airplanes but she had become something much greater a hypercomputer Soon, the men who worked with Bossy found themselves able to solve their problems, to erase their prejudices, in short, to think. Did the world welcome Bossy with open arms and glad cries? No, because for four decades, the world had been in the grip of opinion control, and Bossy represented a serious threat to that dominance. So Bossy had to go underground and work in hiding, which was why Joe Carter, the world's only true telepath, and two brilliant professors had to assume the role of Skid Row Bums. (laughs) And the rest just, like, waxes poetical about the book. But, yeah. Well, that sounds terrible. Um, (laughs) Sounds amazing. That hits a lot of things that I hate. So I'm looking forward to this book. Yeah, yeah. A science fiction book written in the 1950s. There can't be anything possibly wrong about that. It's got... About a telepath and skid row. Yep. Great. Yep. There might be some redeeming... I mean, it won a Hugo Award. So, like, I feel like there might be some redeeming qualities. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I think... uh, That about wraps it up for this Fortnite's podcast. (laughs) Thanks for listening to us ramble on. Thanks for listening. Subscribe to us on uh, iTunes. Yeah, whatever platforms you happen to find find this on, please subscribe on that platform. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah. Do we have a sign off? (laughs) Alakazava, kazetchum, stretchum.